Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our first Luncheon Think About Energy webinar. We're excited to join everyone in this virtual setting. On behalf of all the partners and sponsors with Think About Energy, I hope everyone is staying safe and coping the best they can during these unprecedented times. We look forward to the time when we will see everyone again in person. My name is Matt Henderson. I am the Program Director for Think About Energy, and I'm excited to hear from our panel of experts as they discuss the potential for the petrochemical build-out across the United States. As you have questions for the presenters, please submit them in the Q&A pod located at the top or bottom of your screen. Upon the conclusion of the presentations, our moderator will work through as many questions as we have time. We are recording today's session and we'll have it posted on our website at thinkaboutbriefing.com. I encourage you to check out our website for more history on the program events and a listing of future events. Also, please follow us on Twitter at energy underscore briefing and join in the discussion. At this time, I am pleased to turn the program over to our moderator, George Stark. George is the External Affairs Director Cabot Oil and Gas, and will guide us through the rest of this program. George? Matthew, thank you. And thank you to everyone who's taken time out of their day today to join us. As Matt has mentioned, we have done Think About Energies for the past six years. Uh, we visited various corners of the Commonwealth. This is our first time to do one virtual, and the response thus far has been overwhelming. About 150 people were excited for the opportunity to re-engage in conversation, have some robust dialogue, hear from a panel of experts, but also to hear from you. And again, to re-engage in this notion of energy, what it means for us, because it's, again, here we are at a time with a pandemic, we're all working remotely, but the work still continues and the policy debate will still continue. So we wanted to take the opportunity today to share three experts with you, have them share their wisdom, and then I'll give you the opportunity to ask them questions. So once again, as Matt had said, if you've got some questions, please type them in. We will save them all for uh, the end of the presentation. I can't thank enough again for everyone who's taken the time to join us. Again, I'll start at the end. We've got Carl Morer from the Pennsylvania Manufacturers, uh, Greg Cazera also with Shell Crescent. But we're going to start off this conversation with a little more of a historical and global view. Tom Gelrich has joined us today, and he's going to give us a little overview of uh, the overall outgrowth of petrochemicals, what it's meant for not just the United States, but for the world. Uh, Tom's got a real unique background. So with this moment, I'm going to hand it over to Tom. Tom, please take it away, sir. Thank you. Matt? Ah. The shale gas industry has been very important and has changed the chemical industry. I call them both revolutions. Next. The first revolution we lived through, and that was the OPEC energy embargo. And that changed everything, especially in manufacturing. A short while after the second embargo, I started working for a small company you never heard of called Exxon, uh, designing new ethane crackers. We were designing for Baytown, Texas. We very quickly shifted our efforts to Al Jabal, Saudi Arabia, a small town, fishing town of 3,000 on the Red Sea. And that facility had nothing. And the only reason we were there was because of low cost energy and feedstock or the raw materials in order to make chemicals. And now on to the shale gas revolution. We've seen natural gas prices drop very dramatically due to advancements in technology. And this has really been truly remarkable. The ocean barrier, i.e. Uh, being able to ship our natural gas overseas, creates a barrier because it's very costly because you have to compress the natural gas and you have to get it to cryogenic minus 260 uh, degrees F temperatures. And that's expensive. So the energy savings remains here for US manufacturers. And that's important for 
energy intensive businesses like steel or glass. Next. The chemical industry, next and next, uses fuel and energy, next, as the, as the uh, key cost drivers for producing chemicals. In fact, 80% of the cost of chemicals is made up of these two components. So you can see how low prices directly impact the chemical industry. And with that, the chemical industry has undergone an unprecedented uh, investment boom. Next. Here are the, some of the numbers. I can't even wrap my head around this. $180 billion in capital investment has been announced. But more importantly than some of these, let me put it all in perspective. Next. More than 50% of all manufacturing investment in capital equipment is in the chemical industry today. People, when they think about investing in manufacturing, they think about Tesla Gigafactories or Boeing Jet Factories or Intel Computer Chip Factories. They don't even add up in, in total close to what is being spent right now in the chemical industry. And 70% of that investment is by foreign companies. The reason why? Well, they know that they have to be present in the U.S. if they're going to participate in global markets. And so the investment spending continues. Next. And one of the reasons why it's, it continues and is, is increasingly more important is that chemicals are replacing other materials. When you think about it, some of these things didn't exist 20 years ago. Automobiles being assembled with adhesives instead of welding. Airplanes that are made primarily out of plastic instead of aluminum. Large screen TVs with no glass and very limited, limited material. Next. The chemical industry impacts 98% of all manufacturing. So this is everywhere. It's not in just one niche area. It in fact impacts our lives on a daily basis. Next. Another reason why chemicals are increasing in importance is that as the developing world middle class in countries with populations in the billions, like China and India, is created due to their economic growth, they will start wanting to have the same things we have, the toothbrushes, the, the large screen TVs, the cars, and so on. And their consumption of chemicals, in this case plastics, will grow dramatically. China is already part of the way there. Their consumption is about one third of the US. India is a little bit further behind with one third the consumption of China. But you can see what the effect will be when these countries grow their middle class. Next, I want to talk a little bit about what's, what's relevant to all of us right now. That is COVID-19. The front line of defense for COVID-19 is chemicals. This is something that's not really covered in the media. When you think about it, soap, hand sanitizer, disinfectants, the, the protective suits, the, the ventilators, the masks, the test kits, syringes, and so on, the chemical content of those items is 75%. So chemicals are on the front line of defense. And many of these products, such as the protective suits, couldn't be made with natural fibers as they wouldn't prevent the transmission of the virus. So they're absolutely critical in what's going on right now. Next. And it's also changing the way we think about single-use plastics. Single-use plastics have been a, a, uh, an item that's getting banned left and right globally, but it's critical in the fight of co for COVID-19. We're using it in the medical setting to protect sanitized equipment to cover it, to prevent the COVID-19 from being present on the surfaces. And then we're taking contaminated materials and encapsulating them in plastic bags. 
we didn't have plastic bags, we wouldn't have those type of controls. And now they're being required to protect workers, at least in my area. Supermarkets are banning the use of reusable bags as their source of transmission. And our garbage pickup will only accept plastic bags. No more cardboard containers, no more items that are not wrapped up in plastic. It's remarkable how COVID-19 has changed our perception. And one area that I've been following very closely is 3D printing. On the left, you see uh, the number of 3D printers in Europe by one 3D printer manufacturer. There's quite a lot. And when you think about 3D printers, everybody thinks about them as you know, an individual printer somebody might have in their house or school, and that's true. But there's also these huge 3D printer farms. This one in the picture is more than 200 3D printers. So they have a rapid ability to ramp up production of parts which are needed critically and quickly and they're located in metropolitan areas where the impact of COVID-19 is the worst. Next. And here are a couple 3D printer parts. The one on the left is oxygen valve. It's a moving part. And the one on the right is a respirator, a new design, 3D printed. So, as you can see, the shale gas revolution has influenced the chemical industry and the revolutions taking place now, and it's very topical with COVID-19. With that, I'd like to turn it back to George, but be available for questions later. Tom, I thank you. I appreciate your insights, and again, the history that you bring to understanding how so much was pushed overseas due to cheap energy costs and cheap labor and your visits to Saudi Arabia. But today, we understand that we can't single source all of our chemicals from one region for multiple reasons, terrorism being one of the number one reasons. But now you've got a pandemic where now we're reliant on a certain region, if it's China, for medical supplies. We need to be thinking more broadly and think about the opportunity that we have to onshore these chemical manufacturers, these plastics opportunities, and the idea that when you bring them here to the United States, you know, someone like Greg Kazira can share with us that it doesn't make sense to also concentrate them in one particular area, whether they be the Gulf Coast. So, Greg. I'm going to hand this over to you because I believe that Shell Crescent has done a great job of really showcasing what energy can mean for this region, what it, the opportunities are. So with that said, Greg, I'm going to hand it to you, please, and uh, your opportunity to showcase. Hey, George, thanks. And it's great to be with everybody this morning. You know, I was in San Diego <laughs> about three hours ago, not physically, but on the air. I was in Miami just an hour ago. And what happened, Shell Crescent, we put out a pitch to the folks we work with. And the whole idea was, let's bring manufacturing back here. And the, and the pitch was, did the coronavirus reveal the reason to bring manufacturing back to the United States? It went nuts, folks. I mean, we've had, I've got six hits already. I'm on two national shows coming up this week, another one next week. But the point is, we do have a once in a lifetime opportunity. And, you know, I'm going to just kind of follow up more what uh, Tom started with. That stuff's all important, but the real thing that the average person in the public has suddenly realized that we, I didn't know, I'm in, I'm in the economic development business. I didn't know 80% of our medications came from China. I wouldn't buy my dog food from China. And I'm here. I find out that, the medications my wife and I are taking, the odds are they were made of. And I think suddenly we realized things like respirators, uh, those suits that Tom showed you, all the medical equipment, gloves, most of those things are made overseas. And there was a reason for that, because 
Arab oil embargo, energy crisis. Suddenly we didn't have energy. Asia had cheap labor and that's where it all went. And suddenly, the, and the world is, and I guess really the message today for everybody, the world's changed and it's changed in a lot of different ways. But, you know, certainly the coronavirus has changed everything. Wally Candle, he's a senior VP from Solve. He's a co-founder at Shell Preston. And he's part of our uh, executive committee. He said, look, guys, everybody is focused on the virus. They're trying to get their, help their companies to survive. They're securing their people. So they're not worried about expansion. So they, they get that. But that's going to change, obviously, as we move through this thing. But the first big change happened in 2017. We, we worked with IHS Market and did a study comparing a petrochemical plant, a cracker built here to one built on the Gulf Coast. Their VP called me in October last two, three years ago. And he said, Greg, he said, we thought you might have a slight advantage up there. We had no idea to be this big. But the bottom line, not what that study said, a cracker built here, like Shell, is four times more profitable than one built on the Gulf Coast. That was on Main State 2018 at World Petrochemical Conference. Literally flipped the whole petrochemical world. Nobody could see that coming. And it's all about logistics. We won't get into that. But the big thing, go ahead, go to the first slide. There we go. That's my front yard. We're all sitting here because of the virus. And by the way, my yards never looked that good in April because I never had the time to work with it. But the point is, go ahead, go to the next slide. This is what we're really worried about. And when we did our second study with IHS Market and was on stage last year in 2019, first one just looked at ethane. The second one looked at methane, ethane, propane, butane. And this region, folks, what's really important to everybody on this call is we are advantaged in all those products. And those are all the feedstocks. So it makes sense to be here. But more importantly, this is the only place where we are sitting right now on planet Earth where you can actually build a petrochemical plant on top of the feedstock and in the middle of your customers. By the way, this is Shell Crescent, USA, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. We're not fussy about what section of the, the state of PA you're in. It's all part of it. And one thing you can do for yourselves this morning, please, the brand we adopted about four years ago was Shell Crescent USA. We, the brands that were out there, the Northeast, if you think of Northeast, when we were in Japan, everybody thinks of Boston and New York, not, not good for us. And we drill in this part of the world some of the most technically sophisticated wells on the planet, 3,000 feet, under, 3, 000, 3 miles underground, horizontal, unbelievable. Appalachia doesn't, doesn't cut it, folks. When you say Appalachia, people think about, you know what they think about. No shoes, log cabins. We're better than that. So that's, that's where the brand came from. But go ahead and flip to the next slide. Because we are, a lot of folks, when we started going to these World Petrochemical Conferences, everybody knew the U.S. is producing the gas. What they didn't know is where it's coming from. And 85% of the new natural gas production in this country is coming from here, Shell Crescent, our region, where we are. If you're going to build a, a, a plant that's fueled with natural gas liquids or, or even methane, don't you want to be where the growth is? The rest of the company, country is just breaking even. But here's, the, here's the, the big aha. Go ahead and flip to the next slide. This is where the demand for that stuff is. Polyethylene. Go ahead and flip to the next one. Polypropylene. Seven, over 70% of the demand for those materials is right here. So what we're, what we're doing today, folks, is our natural gas liquids are being shipped somewhere, some to Europe, some to the Gulf Coast. If it goes to the Gulf Coast, they turn it into polyethylene, polypropylene pallets, and they ship them where? Right back up here. So that's what Shell figured out is if you build the plant here, then and with, what, what's Shell doing? They're, they're, when that plant's done, folks, they're going to be trucking most of those polyethylene pellets. And can you imagine right now, if you're making stuff, if you're making a product, even if you're making a ventilator, which people are here, the raw feedstock for that has to come from the Gulf Coast, and it's taken up to 30 to 45 days for it to get here. What Shell's going to be able to do, if you're making that product, you can call them on Monday, and they told us, you could have product by Wednesday. That's huge. And you, you know, anybody that's in business understands inventories. But that's what makes this opportunity such a big deal anymore. And the world's changed. We're the leading oil and gas producer in the world. 
And that's what Tom was talking about is so spot on. That's where these products come from. And what, when I was in just this little bit ago, Miami, their question was, well, you know, why aren't we making this stuff here? Because all of a sudden the public's realizing that, oh my God, these masks, these, these face shields, all this stuff, our medications are all coming from China. We got to fix that. And it left because we didn't have the energy and they had cheap labor. Now, folks, and that's what really this is all about. This is really all about people and protecting them from the virus. That, that, that whole, uh, go ahead, flip to the next slide. Because now we have this incredible opportunity. Those are the wells. Red is the Utica wells, and it probably needs to be updated because there's more of those. Uh, 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 red's the Marcellus, green's the Utica. Funny, at that state line up in northwest, west PA, northeast PA, that's, we all know that that's not a fault. I mean, there's Marcellus on the other side. And, our, and, and think about this, folks. All this stuff that Tom was talking about, that, that New York is crying for ventilators, masks, those gowns, those face shields. He des Cuomo desperately wants that stuff. And you may not have known last week that in his budget bill, he very quietly slipped in a permanent ban on fracking in New York. Folks, it's, we've got to carry that message that the reason why we can manufacture you, the reason why it's so economically feasible is because we're not depending on the Middle East. We're not depending on someone else, to, Russia, to send us our product. We have it here. We have it in this region. We have it literally under the plant. And that's such a big deal that if we would ever do something really stupid like ban fracking, can you imagine going back to the days of the Arab oil embargo and the energy crisis where we were dependent on somebody else? That's our advantage. And if we're gonna protect our people, if we really care about people, the best thing we can do is take advantage of the resources we have right here. And, and by the way, in Ohio, my gosh, there's like, they've got the leading employment in the plastics industry. The people that make stuff out of all these polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC pellets are all here in this region. And they're supplying this market. So what a, if you're gonna supply the U.S. market, the best place to be what we're seeing now, 30 years, this was like the Gulf Coast, 30 years ago, China may have been the answer, Japan may have been the answer. Today, the answer is right here where we sit because we've got cheap energy, cheap feedstock, we've got abundant feedstock. We have now with automation, we can manufacture right here and actually beat China at their own game. And the beauty of that is we're making it here, we're shipping it here, we got the logistical advantage over them. The only thing we have to do is carry that message out because even the manufacturers, as fast as this happened, in the petrochemical industry, there were still people building plants on the Gulf Coast and didn't realize this was the best place to be. They'd already made those big decisions. Now's the time to work with our manufacturers, our petrochemical, our plastics folks, and let's see if we can't change that. It's time to bring that manufacturing here because we have the economic advantage right here in our backyard, folks. So I think that's, uh, matter of fact, just a couple of things. They, they did ask me to mention a couple of things on uh, regulations, a couple of laws that uh, West Virginia passed just recently. By the way, just you know, I, I, uh, thanks for flipping that slide because we already have, we got the wells, and this is, uh, don't worry about all the, the detail on it, but, a lot of pipelines, a lot of fractionators. There's a, a whole bunch of infrastructure here. We don't have underground storage yet for uh, natural for uh, ethane, but that can come very easily. But right now, we've got the pipelines, we've got the wells. There's an awful lot of infrastructure that's here already that we can we can build on. So, but we're already seeing in West Virginia, a law was passed to encourage uh, West Virginia manufacturers to use local natural gas liquids there's some tax credits that they've that they've come up with there there's also in west virginia ohio's already had this where i uh, long story short it's the bypass bill if you're using a lot of natural gas you do, you can actually go direct to the producers or producer consortium so uh, some really good stuff i think that that we're seeing here but you know we couldn't here's really thought to leave you with 
we couldn't control having the virus come. I mean, we can blame the Chinese, but it doesn't really matter because we got to deal with it. We can blame the media because they were so focused on Trump and impeachment that nobody was watching what was going on. But now we have this opportunity. People need to understand the importance of plastics, the importance of petrochemicals that Tom was talking about, and why this is the place on planet Earth where we should be manufacturing masks, we should be manufacturing gloves, we should be doing all that stuff here, and we can, and we can do it economically. We've got to carry that message out there. We need a strong petrochemical industry, and we darn sure got to have a strong oil and gas industry, because if our domestic industry goes away, folks, so does our economic advantage. This is our opportunity to create jobs and to create a healthy environment for our folks because we've already lowered CO2 14% because of increased use of natural gas. We're on track to meet Paris, the Paris Accord, and we're not even there. So this is good for the environment. This is good for our people. And it's, it's, there's going to be another virus. I don't know when, but this is our time to protect people against that by bringing that manufacturing back here, bringing those pharmaceuticals back here. I encourage you, carry the message, call it Shell Crescent USA, but this is our time, folks. Let's make a difference. We'll fix today, but our, our goal is to, we got to help people in the future. We can't control today, but we can darn sure control what we do and make tomorrow a better day for us. Thank you. Appreciate being here. Well, Greg, needless to say, thank you. Uh, your insights are critical uh, on this as we move forward, because to your point, we have to make certain that we have everything prepared for that future. And if you look at the past, the past was to put facilities in the Middle East or elsewhere. And today we see the folly of that. We also understand that, you know, in my lifetime, when I worked for Columbia Gas and a hurricane would hit, you know, the price of natural gas would just spike overnight because they would shut in uh, supply. Now we have the supply everywhere. And it's the opportunity to bring the manufacturers, bring these opportunities for plastics, for ventilators, to bring them where the problem is. And you laid it out. Shell Crescent has that opportunity. It's a very unique situation and area with as much natural gas uh, and ethane that we have. And you're seeing Shell construct its cracker here. And it will be useful to 3D printing. And again, as you mentioned, all the different physical things needed for the healthcare. Uh, especially ventilators. So we want to do everything we can to encourage people to look beyond the Gulf Coast, get them up here to Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And I know with our last speaker, Carl Marrera, he's working diligently to make certain that Pennsylvania is poised to take a hold of that future, get us situated, that we can be prepared for what's next, and be ready to move with the proper policies. So with that, Carl, if you would, I'm looking forward to you sharing with the group what's going on specifically in Pennsylvania from a manufacturing standpoint, what policies we can be addressing, and how we can rise to the occasion and challenge our future. Carl? George, thank you so much for the opportunity um, to, to join the, the web conference here today. Um, give me one second here to share my screen. All right, so hopefully everybody can see this okay. Um, so Pennsylvania's energy opportunity continues. And I, I would say even, and to the point of the other speakers today, I think even it's, it's even more important now than it has ever been. Um, domestic manufacturing, especially for products that, that we're relying on throughout this crisis, um, can and should have their foundational footprint in Pennsylvania. And uh, you know we're seeing in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, the site of the, the largest construction site on, in North America is underway, supporting 6,500 construction jobs. That plant's going to sustain about 600 manufacturing jobs full-time moving forward. Uh, but that's just one part of the Commonwealth. That's just one type. Uh, that's the, you know, the wet gas. That's just one type of gas. Uh, there are other opportunities that exist in Pennsylvania, and that's what we want to talk about here today. So that same opportunity exists in northeastern Pennsylvania, but in a slightly different form. Um, and we had the opportunity to um, talk to some of the folks that are looking to invest in Pennsylvania and bring 
um, this type of manufacturing activity in natural gas synthesis plants to northeastern Pennsylvania. At the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, we have economic modeling tools. We wanted to look at what would the economy of the northeastern portion of the state uh, or and North Central a little bit as we'll get into Clinton County. Um, but but what, is, what does it do to the overall Pennsylvania economy? What does it mean for jobs, not just on the construction site or in the manufacturing plant, but about the indirect and induced jobs? We'll talk a little bit about what that all means. So um, today I'm gonna give you an, an overview of what those projects look like. Talk a little bit about the upfront investment, uh, the direct, indirect and induced jobs during the construction of those plants, the direct, indirect, and induced jobs once those plants are completed, um, and then an overall economic impact of the projects as well as a legislative update. So here's an overview of the projects. There's um, uh, natural gas synthesis plants is kind of its, it, in the overarching category. There's a lot of things that kind of fall under that category. And there are two sites that, that um, you know, potential investors are looking at in Pennsylvania. One is in Clinton County and one is in Luzerne County. The one in Clinton County is nitrogenous fertilizer manufacturing. And nitrogenous fertilizer manufacturing is really, and what they're looking at doing here are creating two different products, ammonia and urea. Uh, ammonia is mainly used in petrochemicals and life sciences and in fertilizer. And urea is, is mainly used in fertilizer which when you think about, I mean, both of those products are super important to the agricultural industry, which is so vitally important in Pennsylvania, and the agricultural manufacturing, the food manufacturing that comes from uh, the Commonwealth is, is just absolutely robust and really is, is necessary for, for the, the health, safety, and well-being of our whole nation. Um, and then in Luzerne County, um, it's actually not nitrogenous fertilizer manufacturing, what they're looking at doing there, and this is all how you have to classify it under the NAICS code, which is the North American Industrial Classification System. Um, there, they're doing what's, what, what NAICS calls other basic organic chemical manufacturing. They're making methanol. Um, there's just no NAICS category for methanol manufacturing, but methanol is, is used in antifreeze, solvent, fuel, feedstock, and, and biodiesel. So something to keep in mind. Nitrogenous fertilizer manufacturing and other basic organic chemical manufacturing, the ammonia, the urea, the methanol, those are themselves manufactured goods. But you also have to consider the fact that those goods are actually the inputs for lots of other manufacturing. So what you see uh, whenever you, you, you see um, um, plants like this go up is that you see a lot of other manufacturing cluster around it. And we wanted to see what that maybe looked like. and and. I think actually the potential is, is there for that the, the numbers that we have are pretty conservative because I'm not sure that it really truly captures all of the, the downstream manufacturing that's going to come from these. The, the National Association of Manufacturers had done some surveys and they found that the back, backward linkage or multiplier effect shows how much additional output is generated by a dollar's worth of financial demand for each industry. Every dollar in final sales of manufactured products supports $1.33 in output from other sectors. This is the largest multiplier effect across any sector. So manufacturing plants therefore have a powerful and positive impact on economic development. So let's look at the, the upfront capital that it's going to take to create these two plants. It's gonna cost around just shy of a billion dollars um, to put these two plants in. And at the time of their construction, so not in real time dollars, but at the time of their construction, that is more than Heinz Field, PNC Park, and PPG Paints Arena combined. Um, and I mean, if you can't tell I'm, uh, where my, my sport allegiance lies, um, it's actually, uh, if, if, if we were to do the same in Philadelphia, it would not be all three of the Philadelphia stadiums, but it would be really, really close. Um, but, but yes, Heinz Field, PNC Park, and PPG Paints Arena combined what it costs to build those three facilities is what it would cost to build two of these in very, very different parts of Pennsylvania. So the construction of the plants um, is going to take around 800 jobs at each plant. So 1,600 different, uh, or 1,600 total construction of manufacturing plant jobs. Construction of manufacturing plant jobs is an NAICS uh, code. Um, so whenever we put six, or I'm sorry, 800 manufacturing 
plant jobs into Clinton County and 800 manufacturing plant jobs into Luzerne County, um, what we see is that there are 629 indirect and induced jobs that will be created um, based on this economic activity. And, uh, the reports that we're getting say that it takes, it's going to take around three-ish years for the construction of the plants to occur. So for three years, um, you're going to see a, a significant surge in accounting needs, um, hospital needs, uh, mining and transportation, re restaurants, retail locations, landscape um, businesses, and, and I mean many, many more. Um, but 629 direct, indirect and induced jobs are, are sustained by that 1,600 jobs that are um, going to be building the plant. So what's the economic impact of that? So the 2000, when you add them together, the, the 2,229 jobs represents about $301.7 million in labor income. Now that's over the, that's not in one year, that's actually over the life of, of the construction of the plants, which again is about two and a half years uh, or 30 months total. Um, but that's gonna have about a, a, a four hundred and nine million dollars worth of value added but it's going to generate 812 million dollars in total economic output and that's not including the billion dollars of upfront uh, initial capital investment this is really just on the the jobs and the the kind of the downstream effect of of the labor wages and the impact that that has on the economy so once the plant is complete um, you this is where we really start to see the power of, of manufacturing plant jobs. This is why I think sometimes um, people might be a little bit confused as to why the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, we're not really a natural gas advocacy type organization. Why are we so passionate about these things? Well, it's because we view the, the natural gas opportunity in Pennsylvania as a way that is going to greatly expand the manufacturing sector and the overall economy of Pennsylvania. And that's absolutely evidenced by this. So each plant would require about 125 um, manufacturing jobs and then an additional 25 oil and gas well drilling and, and well maintenance jobs. So 300 in total direct jobs between the two plants. Those 300 jobs, sustain or create and sustain 717 um, indirect and induced jobs. And this is across many different sectors. Um, a lot of it is in natural gas distribution and transportation and warehousing. But again, especially on the induced side, a lot of the restaurants, uh, real estate agents, legal services, accounting services, all of those all of, all of that economic activity is going to take additional people in other industries to sustain it. Um, and again, when you plug in the numbers of those 300 direct jobs, the result is, is uh, an estimated 717 indirect and induced jobs. And again, what does that mean for um, the, the economic impact of, of the, the region and these regions in Pennsylvania? Well, the this is yearly. This is not over 30 months or the span. This is yearly because these jobs stay. These have a lot of staying power. Um, so it's uh, $119 million in labor income every year, $185 million in value added every year, spurring $524.5 million in total economic output every single year that these plants are operational. So uh, a quote from our president and CEO um, that says, based on the results, it's clear that these projects would be transformative to Northeast Pennsylvania and the Commonwealth as a whole. Entire economies are centered around this type of economic activity and will sustain regions for generations to come. Attracting and retaining natural gas synthesis manufacturing ought to be a priority of policymakers at the state and federal level to ensure that this prosperity occurs in our Commonwealth as opposed to a competitor state. So the overall economic impact is shown. Um, we've got uh, you know, uh, almost a billion dollars of initial investment. We've got a total of 2,229 2, direct, indirect, and induced jobs during construction. 
another 1,017 direct, indirect, and induced jobs upon completion. If you look at four years of total economic output on this project, we're looking at $1.6 billion. Again, not counting the initial investment. That's on top of the initial investment. Uh, these are staggering numbers, especially for a region of the Commonwealth that desperately needs it. So a legislative update, there was a, a, a bill, House Bill 1100, that was a Pennsylvania-focused production-based tax incentive. It was based off of the same manufacturing and um, um, uh, uh, tax incentive that, that created the or, or the opportunity for the Shell petrochemical plant out west. Uh, it was passed in the Senate on, on February 4th, um, 39 to 11. It was concurred in the Pennsylvania House, uh, 157 to 35 on the same day. And I apologize, it should say March 27th. Um, it was vetoed by the governor on March 27th, not April 27th. It was it is not in the future yet. Uh, although I, I'm very excited for it to be April 27th, because maybe we will be closer to the end of all this madness. Um, but um, Governor Wolf vetoed the bill on, on March 27th. If you look at the the majority of the passing or the, the numbers uh, that, that passed the bill, 39 to 11, 157 to 35, those are veto-proof majorities. But it would take going back and actually overriding the veto, which I don't believe has been done in Pennsylvania since the Ridge years, but there is, uh, you know, I, I, I challenge accepted. Um, I think that, that we, um, we have the support to do that, and, and hopefully we will be making a push to do that very soon. Again, another quote from uh, Dave, Dave Taylor that says, House Bill 1100 was passed with overwhelming bipartisan support in the General Assembly, was supported by both business and labor, and balanced environmental and industrial needs. This bill meant high paying jobs for Pennsylvania's skilled tradesmen and workers at a time, um, at a time of great economic crisis. We are deeply disappointed in Governor Wolf's decision to veto this important legislation. So some next steps, we're gonna learn more about these industries, the impact that they have on the economy. We're gonna promote this industry and Pennsylvania as a location for natural gas synthesis manufacturing. And we're gonna to advocate to state lawmakers to embrace natural gas synthesis manufacturing opportunities here, again, as opposed to our, com our, our competitor states. A brief word on that, um, West Virginia actually passed um, in their legislature and had their governor sign a bill very, very similar to House Bill 1100. So in the time that it took basically the, the Senate to sign the bill and send it to the governor, West Virginia replicated, passed, and approved um, a, a bill very similar. Um, that could be troubling for, for Pennsylvania's investment moving forward. So we're going to advocate and then hopefully we're going to override Governor Wolf's veto decision with a two-thirds majority in both the Pennsylvania House and the Pennsylvania Senate. So that's all that I have. Um, there are just enormous opportunities here. There are really, really big, almost uncomprehendable numbers, um, especially for parts of, of Pennsylvania that haven't seen this kind of investment in a long time. The main thing that I want you to take away from this is that these opportunities exist. They are incredibly exciting. And again, where one of these opportunities typically exists, more opportunities are created. Um, yes, they are manu the 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 fertilizers are themselves are, are finished manufactured goods, but so many manufacturers are going to use these feedstocks and future products. And it's really going to make Pennsylvania a hub and a place where we should be making the things that America needs uh, for generations to come. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Carl, I can't thank you enough. And you did a great job of really wrapping up what Pennsylvania needs to do, because we're seeing West Virginia already do it. We know that Ohio has Jobs Ohio, and it is moving forward. So if you think about this just momentarily, you've got a group of states that are not competitors. We need to be a region. We need to be prepared to promote what we have, which is an abundant amount of energy, Greg has laid out how our area can rival the Middle East or the Gulf Coast. We've got a guy in Tom who understands how he went to a what was then a, a town of 10 people in Saudi Arabia that now is the epicenter for petrochemical manufacturing. So it went from nothing to the core, whereas today we have that opportunity to do it here in America. And if you're going to do it in America, the Shell Crescent is the place to do it. 
And again, we talked a little bit about House Bill 1100 and the fact that West Virginia is moving forward on their downstream opportunities. What you're really looking at is a conversation that was taking place prior to the pandemic. Now you've got states like New York and others who are in virtual need of ventilators. And as you heard from Tom, all the plastics that come from, that, come from that. All this is coming together at a time that is gonna lead Pennsylvania to, as you mentioned, Carl, the other side of April, May, June. When we get this pandemic behind us, but we've got to get our economy started and rebooted. And what you'll see is that opportunity to really stop and think about, wait a minute, should we have manufacturing here? So when we ask you all to stop and think about energy, now you're getting a real sense of that history, why this region is important, and how we can move this conversation forward to ensure that Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia can be making the ventilators, can have all the plastics necessary to get it to the first responders, to get those bio suits to healthcare, to get uh, glasses and eye protection. Those are the things we need right now. We should have them available. So again, great opportunity to do that. The good news is we're getting questions also. And one of the questions that uh, was asked was, what are the plans for the veto override of uh, the governor's veto of 1100? And I, again, uh, Carl, you can help out with this one also. But what I have heard clearly from labor is now is not the time to do the veto override. Now we need to focus on COVID-19, getting people back to work, getting this pandemic behind us, getting businesses reopened. But when we think about it, that six month future is getting the economy going. 1100 is its own economic stimulus package that I could see being part of an override effort to get this economy rolling again. And Carl, you laid out the numbers that are there. Anything else from your perspective from Harrisburg, what you're hearing, Carl? Um, I agree. I think that, you know, obviously all efforts right now are dedicated to ensuring that Pennsylvanians remain as, as safe um, and healthy as possible. Um, but I also do think that we're going to need to take a really long, hard look at what we want the future of Pennsylvania and this region to be. And, um, you know, I, I, to, to, to Greg's point and also to Tom's point, um, when they talked about the different products that are necessary and, and what we're realizing, we've become kind of too dependent on foreign nations for, we could be making here. And this is, this is, one, of those, this is one of those things. And what a, what a wonderful opportunity to take a resource that we have so abundantly in Pennsylvania and make the products that we need and employ a whole lot of Pennsylvanians in the process. And um, I, I think that that's not lost on lawmakers, but I think it's something that we're going to need to continue to talk about and advocate for, which is what we're, what we're doing today. I think by learning more about the numbers and the, the projects, um, we can better advocate as, as advocates for this industry. Another question that has come in has to do with, you know, as we get these con congressional stimuluses, you know, stimulus two, stimulus three, what will be four is upcoming. There's a question out there asking, you know, what can we do to ensure that small businesses get the resources that they need to retool to go into manufacturing? I'll look to you, Carl. I don't know if you have anything, and then I'll, I'll ask Greg next. Yeah, I wish I—I I mean, I wish I had more um, to, to more of an answer on this. Um, you know, so much of our time um, in the last fourteen to sixteen days has really been centered on just trying to keep parts of the manufacturing sector open. Um, Governor Wolf, with his uh, business declaration, business closure declaration, didn't follow some of the federal guidelines that we, we needed him to follow. So a lot of our time has been spent with 
various manufacturers uh, across the entire Commonwealth trying to establish waivers for them to, to stay open. And, and honestly, a lot of them to stay open to retool their lines to make some of the products that, that Pennsylvanians need right now. So I haven't been able to follow some of the federal stimulus uh, uh, information as closely as I wish I, I, I have been able to. Um, that said, we have a lot of resources on our website. If you go to uh, pamanufacturers.org backslash COVID-19, um, and it's also right on our homepage, we have a ton of resources. A lot of them are coming directly from Senator Toomey, um, and I know that he has supplied a lot of information uh, <coughs> pertaining to small business uh, needs at this time and, and the different stimulus packages that are going to be passed. But uh, I, I, I wish, again, I, I wish I, I had more detail, but that's not unfortunately where a lot of our time allocation has gone into to really dissecting uh, some of the things that have been, been passed in Congress right, right now. So I'll defer to some of the expertise of my colleagues, but uh, please do use that resource. Again, it's pamanufacturers.org backslash COVID-19. Thank you, Carl. Greg, anything to add that you're aware of? Because I do have I think a question. One of, the challenges that, one of the challenges that we have, because Shell Crescent, we focused on the petrochemical industry, helping those folks to understand, you know, when we sit down with CEOs and explain our advantage, when that happened two years ago, they were shocked. I mean, I had one CEO I actually looked at his assistant and said, so what these guys tell me makes sense. And he said, I think so. He just committed $6 billion to the Gulf Coast and realized he put it in the wrong spot. But what we're not, what we haven't done, and maybe the people on this call can help us with, is we really haven't talked to the converters. I wonder how many of those folks really understand the opportunity that they have with a shell being able to ship them product in two days. And maybe I was just thinking from when, while Carl was talking, maybe one thing we could do with a stimulus package, maybe they could put an incentive because it does cost business money to retool maybe they should put an incentive in there for companies that will make respirators, ventilators, some of these other critical healthcare items and encourage them to begin to do that here. For a small business owner, that might be the incentive they need to, okay, let's tool up and let's make, be in a position to make some of this stuff here. But that's what I- And Greg, do. along those lines, Greg, I know that some of the policymakers are, are trying to figure out how we can help reinvest in brownfields so it'd be a combination of both because mm -hmm. oftentimes a brownfield is going to have infrastructure already whether it's overhead power lines or a natural gas line to it and again you go and go from many places in Ohio or West Virginia to Pennsylvania that have uh, idled brownfields that could be developed I'm going to switch to Tom. Can I, can I add one more thing, George? Because this is you may, it really helped you. Folks. I was talking to one of my friends who's in, he's a converter. I don't know that many of them, but, but and I said, Doug, how you doing? He says, oh, Greg, he says, he's, he's like mid fifties. He said, this, these last two weeks are the busiest of my entire career. I said, well, hold on, what are you doing? He's making parts for ventilators. So can you imagine and, and the companies that are in that yes, place are doing very well right now, matter of fact, he's looking for people. And this helps with the next question for Tom, because, you know, again, we talk about ventilators. Tom, if you could, I think you have a sense of the growth overall of plastics. You know, the question is, you know, we, we hear about campaigns to uh, stop utilization of plastics are you seeing that catch on and there actually being a decrease in the need for plastics or what my heart's telling me actually no even with all the campaigns there actually will be more needs for plastics could you put some numbers around that tom sure um if we look historically and going forward into the future the growth of plastics has always been bigger than gdp i.e. it's growing faster than the rest of the economy is growing. And when we look at some of these plastic bans and these plastic issues, they've targeted things like plastic bags in supermarkets or plastic straws. Well, you're talking about maybe one-tenth of one percent of the plastics. This is not the area to focus in on. So plastics continue to grow um, and continue to grow bigger than the rest of the economy.
my apologies there. I was reviewing some of the other questions. And it looks like there's a lot more questions in a sense of just overall growth for this area coming from a stimulus. So again, I think that's going to be something we'll need to have a continued conversation on. Again, there was a question there in the sense for Carl. Carl, with the numbers you presented, they're, they're just fantastic. I mean, you, you know, the, the amount of money being invested, the amount of jobs being produced or uh, as an outcome. What are you finding that this group can help you do to break through the noise? What more can we be doing, Carl, to assist you in your outreach efforts from PMA specific to 1100? Well, being here today and learning about it is, is the, the first, is, is definitely the best start. Um, so we put together, whenever we released this study, um, a web page dedicated to it on our um, on our, our pamanufacturers.org. So if you go to pamanufacturers.org backslash N-E-P-A NAT gas, um, and it, it was on the slides, which I think are going to be shared as well. It's on the bottom of the slides. Um, if you go to that URL, um, you'll see the, the press release that we put out. You'll see the full study. But we also put together about five different infographics. Um, and those infographics are really uh, important in, in trying to communicate just because these are really big numbers and it's hard to un understand and comprehend. So we tried to tear some of those numbers down and create um, some, some visualization so that people can kind of digest it, not just legislators, but press as well. Um, so utilize, um, no pride of ownership, please go there, take those resources and spread them around. Uh, we need, I think the only way to really um, kind of break through the noise is to make sure that, I mean, we are the noise um, and, and you know, talk about it. And, and whenever you have conversations with colleagues, if you have press contacts, reach out make sure they know about it um, because if we're the noise that's being talked about then we're setting the conversation and that's a good place to be understood well i, I see the time i've got one last question before i hand this back over to mr henderson but uh, the last question will go to joe hunt and it has to do with the idea of as we talk about 1100 and we see what other states are doing as we're advancing new legislation are there specific roadblocks or regulations that we need to be thinking about that we can help educate our elected officials that stand in our way to really grabbing that future that we could have i'll leave i'll open that to either one of you i'll i'll, I'll touch on this i because we run into this all the time i can't tell you how many times I've gone to um, different hearings on different projects and you run into a lot of the same arguments and it's usually around the environmental impacts. And, you know, I'm, I myself am, am, am a sportsman, a conservationist. Um, and, you know, what I always say to people is, is this, and it's, I think that this crisis really outlines it very well. The products that natural gas creates are essential for modern life. Um, it's whether it's, you know, plastic products, whether it's coatings or styrofoams, rubbers, whether it's fertilizer, um, these are all products that are necessary for the way that we, we used to and, and hopefully will soon live, live current life. Um, Pennsylvania has the, some of the, if not the strictest regulations when it comes to the extraction of those resources. Pennsylvania also has some of the strictest regulations when it comes to the manufacturing of goods using those resources and the transportation of those goods using those resources. So I think a true environmentalist, while having to admit that these products are very, very necessary for the way that we currently live, I would rather those, those products and those resources be extracted here in our commonwealth, where there's the maximum amount of, of oversight, where there's a maximum um, conscientiousness when it comes to the environment than anywhere else. I would much rather that happen here than in Saudi Arabia or in Russia, uh, where God knows what those regulations look like or how they're complied with. We know that that compliance happens here. We know that those pra pra the practices are, are, are done in a very, very positive way here. Um, so as you encounter some of the pushback environmentally, I would challenge that with, um, you know, do you think that these products are not necessary at all? And if they're holding even so much as a cell phone, uh, they're, they're kind of being hypocritical. 
Um, but um, you know, those or ask them how they how they got there today. Um, I understood. I understood. Well, so that, I, that's I, how I would push back. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll let Tom or a closing quite or a closing comment on that notion of are we overlooking anything? Um, Greg, Tom. Because, you know, they're worried about single use bags. And one of the things that we're doing, we're working with recyclers and we're talking with a foreign company, two of them actually. And what they want to do, this, this gentleman said, he said, look, you guys are banning this stuff. He said in, in developing countries, even in my country, he said, those plastic bags are what people take to the market. And when they throw their meat in there, they throw them away. He said, but what we can do now with technology, every one of these states can do it. And what he's going to, he's working on is a process to make biodegradable bags. Because here, we don't have a plastics problem. If anything, we have a disposal problem. People don't throw it away. Once it gets into the waste stream, we can fix it. In Asia, the waste disposal company is the river. And that's why he wants to develop something and work. But the beauty of it is, where does he want to make his biodegradable bags? He wants to make them here. And right now we're, we're negotiating between the three states where he's going to land. But the beauty of it is we have a company from Asia that wants to come here and make biodegradable plastic bags. What a deal. It's wonderful. Awesome. Wonderful. I, I, I appreciate your closing words. And again, Tom, not to leave you out, anything that you have to, uh, to share with us on things you see that would be obstacles standing in our way as we move forward. I think the single biggest obstacle, and we've hit on it a couple of times, is education. If we think about it, the chemical industry, and you know, we've got the numbers to prove it, is where manufacturing and where the jobs have been in the last 10 years in the U.S. That's where companies are willing to invest money in. And COVID-19 has shown that chemicals are of increasing importance in medical and other fields. So why don't we make those products here and have a reliable supply. It, it closes the whole circle. Here, here, I can't agree with you more. And again, you saw that circle start, and here we are closing it as we close out this presentation. So again, I wanna thank you, Tom. I wanna to thank Greg. I wanna thank Carl for your enthusiasm, your wisdom, and your knowledge, and your sharing that with us. I can't say enough uh, on that end of what you've provided us. Thank you all. Thank you to those that have tuned in, that have joined us for our first virtual Think About Energy. I know this, this will not be our last. So again, I wanna thank you all for taking the time out of your day today to join us. I need to hand it back over to Matt Henderson, who's got some closing remarks. Thank you, Matt. George, thank you. And again, great conversation. And I always uh, hate to interrupt an ongoing conversation. We had some great questions and great information. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that we will post the webinar recording once we are uh, edited it slightly. It'll be on our website. Look for an email so you can access that or share it with your friends and, and forward that to uh, other people as well. Uh, the PowerPoints as well as have been shared by the presenters will be on there for your uh, to, to look through, and if you have any questions, I encourage you to reach out to the presenters uh, directly as well. So as uh, George mentioned, uh, we do have another upcoming webinar. It might be slightly different than the typical Think About Energy, but uh, this is very timely, and we think this is an extremely important topic. Uh, as you see, on the 16th next week, we're going to host a, another luncheon, a 12 to 1 webinar, where we're going to discuss a community response during COVID-19. We have a lot of our partners on here from the nonprofit world, talking about uh, some food banks, uh, Commonwealth Charitable Management Group, uh, and a few others yet to be determined. But we want to talk about what they're doing, but also more importantly, what their needs are. We, we know a lot of our participants and a lot of the industry has stepped up, uh, but these companies are also looking for a little bit more of awareness to see what's going on. And uh, we think this would be great to tune in and help share that message as we move forward. So again, thank you on behalf of the Think About Energy team. We appreciate your participation today. Please check our website out for more information and look forward to seeing everybody in the future. Have a great day and stay safe.